Thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk about the transverse plane today. Um, I, if you are a reader of the blog or you subscribe to the blog, uh, you've probably noticed that I talk about the planes a lot. Probably in every post I mention the plane or the planes at least once. And so I wanted to do this uh, video, or I wanted to do this for a while because I think it's really important to understand the planes in order to visualize what's actually happening at the joint. And I also wanted to do this for my students so that they had something that they could refer back to because it really does take a while to learn this and it really just takes that repetition um, and just trying to reinforce and just try to be able to see it without even really thinking about it, okay? So we're starting with the transverse plane today and if you look at the clock here, you can see that if I put the clock like this, the clock itself is lying in the frontal plane, and we'll do that in a separate video. And the axis is actually perpendicular to the plane. So you can see the axis is perpendicular to the plane. And so what I'm going to do today is just talk about the transverse plane. But one thing that I want you to understand is that the axis is always perpendicular to the plane. So if I take the same clock here and I put it in a different position so I'm going to take it and put it here and you can see that the clock is lying parallel to the floor this is how you'll see it in most of the anatomy books it's actually cutting the body into upper and lower halves but you can see that the clock is actually lying parallel to the floor so it's cutting the skeleton into upper and lower halves and of course the axis would be perpendicular to the plane. So it would be running uh, from superior to inferior. So we would call it a superior inferior axis or just a vertical axis, okay? So the key is, is that the axis is always perpendicular to the plane. So if I take the plane and I put it here, okay, you can see that it is parallel to the floor and now I can move my head and neck to the right and we would describe that as a rotation. So it would be rotation or right rotation of the head and neck at the cervical spinal joints and of course that would be around a vertical or superior inferior axis and it's very clear it's a rotation. So if you look at the transverse plane you can see that most of the motions that occur um, in the transverse plane um, are described as a rotation and we'll show you the exceptions to that or one of the exceptions to that rule. So again if you look at this motion you can see the rotation the head and neck are rotating in what we would call the transverse plane. So we would call that rotation of the head and neck at the cervical spinal joints. And so if you look at it, you can see that the mandible, the jaw, remains parallel to the floor, okay? Now I can sit, take that same transverse plane and now position it, we'll say at the shoulder, okay? So it's, the plane is still parallel to the floor and I put it here and now I can actually move the arm Okay, across that plane. Okay, so the plane is still parallel to the floor. We're calling it a, the transverse plane. And if you look at the hand, the form, and the arm together, they are moving along that plane. And the hand, the form, and the arm are remaining parallel to the floor. Okay, so we would describe this as this is a starting position horizontal adduction or horizontal flexion and then of course if I go in the opposite direction or back to that starting position it would be horizontal extension or horizontal abduction so it's horizontal flexion or horizontal adduction and then we would say horizontal abduction or horizontal extension to go back to that starting position okay and if we take the axis, you can clearly see that the axis 
at the glenohumeral joint here at the shoulder joint is running from vert is vertical or running from superior to inferior, so we would call it a superior inferior axis or vertical axis, and you can see that that motion of the arm, the humerus at the shoulder joint, is moving around that axis. Okay, so then we take that same plane and we can imagine it again down at the hip or the pelvis, so we'll put it here, and I can take, imagine that the femur's fixed now, and we can move the pelvis around that same axis in the same plane. Okay, so the axis is running in the same direction, so we would describe it as vertical or superior inferior again, and the pelvis is moving around that axis. So again, try to imagine that the femur is fixed to so see it in isolation. Okay, and you can see that the iliac crest and the ischial tuberosity remain parallel to the floor. Okay, so now imagine the foot's off the ground and that we'll say that the femur itself is moving on the pelvis. So now we have a femur that's moving medially. Okay, so it's moving in, so we would call it medial rotation or internal rotation depending on how you learned it. So if this is the starting position, the femur is moving in, so we describe it as internal rotation or medial rotation, and again, that's occurring around a vertical axis, okay? And then we can go from this position to this position, and we would describe that as lateral rotation or external rotation. So it's medial rotation or internal rotation, and lateral rotation or external rotation and those motions are occurring around a vertical axis. So because this is a ball and socket joint we have motion of the pelvis okay on the femur and we have motion of the femur on the pelvis. So if we just look at the transverse plane we have motion of the pelvis Okay, and we have motion of the femur. Okay, then if we go down to the knee joint, this is a great example of the knee because the knee is a modified hinge joint. So it's not a pure hinge joint, it's a modified hinge joint. And what that means is it's actually going to allow for two planes of motion. So we, I think you know at this point that you have this motion available to you. So we would call this extension of the leg or the lower leg at the knee joint. So extension of the leg or the lower leg at the knee joint. Extension and of course flexion of the lower leg at the knee joint. So that's occurring in the sagittal plane. Now because this is a modified hinge joint it also allows for what we would call transverse plane motion. So if you look at this from this angle you'll notice that the foot is moving parallel to the floor or parallel to the transverse plane. So now I can take the lower leg and you'll get more motion if you try this when the leg is flexed at the knee joint or the lower leg is flexed at the knee joint. So I get lateral rotation or external rotation of the lower leg at the knee joint and then from that position back to the starting position I get medial rotation or internal rotation. Okay, so now from this position, again the foot still moving parallel to the floor, I get medial rotation and or internal rotation depending on how you learned it. Okay, so same position, we'll go from here back to that starting position and we'll call that lateral rotation or external rotation and I go all the way out to that position. Okay, so you can see that that lower leg is clearly rotating and that motion is occurring in the transverse plane at the knee joint. Okay, and that's a really, really important motion to our overall function. Okay, another example that I want you to understand 
is we talked about motion of the arm at the shoulder joints. So we call this horizontal flexion or horizontal uh, adduction. Okay, but I want you to understand the same joint, still a ball and socket joint, that glenohumeral joint, is same joint, we can take the same axis, and now we'll just flex the form at the elbow joint, and if you look at the form and you watch the form, kind of like the foot, you'll see that the form is moving parallel to the floor. Okay, so just like the foot in the last example, you can see that the form is moving parallel to the floor or parallel to the transverse plane, okay? And so when you look at this motion, you can see that the arm or the motion is initiated at the shoulder joint or the glenohumeral joint. So we're not really focusing on the form here. The form is moving along the plane or remaining parallel to the floor, but the motion is initiated up at the shoulder, okay? So same, shoulder, same joint, same plane, but a different motion. So we would describe this as lateral rotation of the arm at the shoulder joint and medial rotation of the arm at the shoulder joint. So again, lateral rotation of the arm at the shoulder joint or external rotation of the arm at the shoulder joint and medial rotation of the arm or humerus, or we could call that internal rotation of the arm or humerus at the shoulder joint, okay, depending on how you learned it, okay? So now we go down to the forearm, and this gets really tricky because if I hold the humerus and the humerus is fixed, and now I move the forearm, you can clearly see that that's a rotation. Okay, so I'm holding the humerus or the arm, that thing that we just moved, right, that body part or bone that we just moved in the transverse plane. So now I'm holding that so that it can't move, and now I have motion, this is anatomical position. So I'm gonna take the palm of the hand, okay, and it's gonna be moving, but, we'll, but it's actually initiated at that radia ulnar joint. So it's the form, okay, moving at what we would call the radial ulnar joint. So if you look at it, you'll see pronation, okay? So pronation of the form at the radial ulnar joint and supination of the form at the radial ulnar joint. So again, you can see the hand moving, but the hand is only moving because the motion is initiated at that radial ulnar joint or that proximal radial ulnar joint. So it's a rotation, but we don't describe it that way. We actually describe it as pronation and supination of the form at the radial ulnar joint, okay? So when we go back and we look at the form for a different motion, you're gonna see that the form, of course, can also move in what would be called the sagittal plane Okay, but that would be at a different joint, and that joint, the elbow joint or humeral ulnar joint, is a pure hinge joint, so it's allowing for motion in this plane. Okay, if you look at the head of the radius, you can kind of see it here. The head of the radius is a convex surface, and it is sitting on a concave surface on the ulna, so that's called the radial notch. And then that radius actually spins on the ulna. So imagine the ulna's fixed and that convex surface of the radius, okay, is moving on the concave surface of the ulna. And we have rotation of the form, but we don't describe it that way. So that radius is moving on the ulna because it's a pivot joint. It's a pivot joint, and it's allowing for transverse plane motion, but we describe it as pronation or supination, just depending on which direction that form is moving, okay? Another example of the transverse plane move, uh, motion that you see in everyday life is if you look around the room, you'll probably see a door, and that door 
is moving in the transverse plane. So if you look at the bottom of the door or even the top of the door, the bottom of the door remains parallel to the floor, okay, and the top of the door remains parallel to the floor and, of course, the ceiling, okay. And then if you look over where that motion is actually occurring, you'll see an axis, and that axis is vertical or superior or inferior. So the axis is perpendicular to the floor or the ceiling. Okay, so that's a great way to try to visualize the transverse plane. Thanks for joining us today.